um, but I'm going to try, since I've known him since I was three years old, um, and he's been with us since then. And I've, I've said it before, but um, it's kind of embarrassing for me that Chip had to come and tell us his story, because I never saw this story, even though he was right in front of me for many, many years. So bad journalism on my part. Um, but uh, I'll start with Abdul. Abdul, sounds that you've heard, what makes you shiver, get scared, when you think back on the different sounds that you've heard? What are some of the iconic ones that you, that bring back memories for you? Okay, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank everybody who are in here. And uh, secondly, you're still too young. I, can, <laughs> I start with my age mate. <laughs> 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 thank you very much for bringing me up here. Although I didn't uh, prepare my speech, I know I'll fumble. But um, <coughs> the sound that uh, still on my head is the sound from Rwanda and uh, Southern Sudan. This is, this is the sound that is still up to now. You have seen me shedding tears here. That was because one of the sound man was killed. While I look, his body was not in a proper way. The secondly, the house which was burned in Southern Sudan and the body, so this one, it will never fade up from my memory. Patrick, on your side, one of the things that, that really hit me about your interview in particular, is when you talk about the, 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 the phrase that resonates, I think, with a lot of the screenings that have happened, is the animals bit, that why, you know, we are much worse than animals. Um, things that you will never forget from the things that you've seen, and, and maybe a story about Abdul that make, bring, makes you smile at least a little bit, since you spent so much time together. There's so many things that I would, I would talk about that I will never forget. Um, coming from places like children dying of, of famine in places like Somalia, just because two people are, want to cling to power and they've got their militias fighting each other and they forget um, that there's human life out there. Um, things like seeing a child uh, with, without hands, they've been chopped off in Sierra Leone trying to plate a doll's hair. Uh, and, and, and you wonder, I mean, who would do this to a little three-year-old? I mean, in the, in, in the documentary there's a comment I make about a three-year-old, uh, a three-month-old baby. I mean, how extreme do we get? I mean, animals will only do this in self-defense or in defense of their young. Or they will go out and kill because they're hungry, right? Which is just nature. But to devise these ways of skewering children or getting a, someone like this gentleman here to kill his entire family, because you're given the option, Shall we rape and kill your children in front of you? Or do you want them to have the way, uh, easy way out? You kill them, and then we kill you. And then what they do is they go ahead and make you kill your family, and then they let you go. I mean, you're going to be mad for the rest of your life. I mean, you can't live like that. Uh, and these were the things which, for me, I said, don't try and say we are like animals, because animals don't do such things. Abdul and I. Uh, there's that incident where we are being bombed, shelled, and we are lying next to dead bodies. We laughed about it later, but at that moment it was not funny. Mm -hmm. Where we say, you know what, if our parents knew what we were going through, <laughs> they would say, come home for the rest of your lives and we'll feed you for free. Um, they did, are th did your family, let me interrupt this, right? did your families, both of you, did your families ever realize prior to seeing this film what you actually do for a living? Did, they, did it actually sink in what you actually, what you guys have been through? Not particularly, in my, on, on, on my part. I mean, uh, but, I, I, I uh, think... Sorry, yeah. On my part, blue. I think my wife still want me to continue. I've heard what she said. Mm -hmm. So, 
I think I'll uh, continue. But anyone here who wants a gardener, I will. <laughs> I'm, ready. I'm ready to do the job. <laughs> Yeah, okay, let, let me move the chip. Well, I was just going to mention one thing related to that is um, this is the only, probably only, it's the second time we've done an event like this with the four of us on stage, but it really might be the last time. It's hard to say. But one story from the first time was when the, we were in Nairobi, uh, actually with Jim and Sue Town, who are here tonight too. Um, and at the end of the screening, Patrick's daughter came over to uh, <coughs> talk with me specifically. And she just said, thank you for making the film because she was 20 years old and she was in the womb at the time of the genocide in Rwanda and she had not heard these stories at home. So this was really for her, the daughter, it was the first time she was hearing about her father's career and the types of work that he did and the danger that he put himself in to be able to tell these stories. So there's the spouse, but there's also the children. And, and I think maybe your family also yep. experienced that. For me, I, uh, all my, I have four children. Three of them were born while I was not at home. One was born when I was in Somalia. The other one I was in Rwanda. The other one I was in Sudan. So this little one, who is now closer to me, and he's trying to be a journalist, because the second born, I took him to media house, to, to media school. When I went to Rwanda, I think last, last year, was it last year or early this year? When I came back home at around midnight, the following morning I asked, where is the, the boy? Well, his mom told me that he's in a police academy. So he left a media house media school, go to academy. I myself, I was trained two weeks in a police academy, but uh, later on I find out I'm not the right material for that <laughs> job. <laughs> because one, the instructor will come very early in the morning at 4, 4, 4.30, they will order you, they will just shout, recruit! Recruit all the time. Then I said, I'm not the right material <laughs> for this. Yeah, so you decided to go work for my so dad. I decided, that. I decided <laughs> now I'm, I'm not going to work. I got a chance to go to camera picks to Mohammed Amin's. So the first day, Mohammed also shouted, and then I told him, I'm from Police Academy. <laughs> the instructor was like you, so I don't want to work. I took my jacket, <laughs> I carry my jacket. I left the office. He sent one of the guys after one week to go and look for me at, in Kibera. So I went back, we compromised, and then up to now I'm there. But, but tell me about your wedding, Abdul. You, you know, your wedding day? Because you didn't tell that in the story, or Chip didn't put that in the film. I didn't include it in the film, but it's a great story. Yeah. During my wedding day, my cousin is somewhere around here. <laughs> He, he can also tell. <laughs> My wedding day, especially the first day of the wedding, I was on the street covering riot with Mohammed Amin. <laughs> we covered riot for hours and hours, and uh, he told us to go back and celebrate. And when we reached home, he told me, okay, now you can change from jeans and uh, the camera jacket, put on your suit, and then celebrate. I said, thanks, I'm not going back to the street. Uh, after 40 minutes, he came straight to me and said, okay, go and change again. <laughs> we, are supposed to go to, we are supposed to go and film the riot because news can't wait. Wedding can wait, but news can't wait. So I went back and the change, and then I went back to the, to the street. So you should have it. stayed as a policeman, Abdul. You should have stuck as a policeman. In Africa, you make much more money as a policeman as well. Trust me, much more money. But I was not uh, the right material for that job, sir. <laughs> <laughs> because... <laughs> Did Muhammad stop yelling at you? Yeah, after, after that, we are just like a friend now. <laughs> Chip, why make this film? I mean, what you, you explained a little bit earlier on about 
you know, hearing Abdul's story while we were in Ethiopia, <coughs> not mentioning that we used to wake up at 12 o'clock and stuff while they were up early, but that's another story. Um, why make the film? Well, there's, there's, from a production perspective, having been a filmmaker for a long time, I've always found it interesting that the sound men, I started in news, and the sound men usually get very little credit, but they're there, and in many cases, they're more of the eyewitness to history than the photographer is, because the photographer's usually looking through the viewfinder. They only, they see a very limited window. And a lot of times the correspondents get all the, all the press and all of the accolades, but the sound person, I think in many cases, and certainly in Abdul's case, they're the real eyewitness. Um, but the second part of the story was getting to know Abdul personally and seeing his sense of humanity and realizing that he might be in a position to articulate these atrocities better than, than certainly better than I could and better than most journalists I know could. Um, what happened during production uh, that was unexpected, I don't, I don't know if, if we've talked about this, but when Abdul did break down um, over the crisis in which four fellow journalists were lost in Somalia, um, that was the third time we had discussed that. And I learned a lot in the production because the first two times we discussed it, we were speaking in English. And I knew so much more about what had happened in Rwanda than I did about what had happened with that incident in Somalia. And so we had talked about Rwanda on numerous occasions. And that third time we did the interview, we switched to Swahili. And the entire interview changed because you were speaking in your native language. And when, uh, when we got to that part of the story, there were three other people on the crew with me, all of whom knew Abdul much better than I and worked with him much longer than I. And none of them had heard that story told that way. So it was an interesting thing just by changing the language, it opened up the opportunity to really share the individual emotional part of that story. And, and uh, I know Patrick has insights into that story as well. But the humanity that you bring forth in that discussion, we, I didn't expect it. And it was, I think it's the heart of the film in many ways. I'm going to open it up to the floor in a second. I just want to ask, how many, how many are working camera men, women here? Put or, up your hands. Any, any, anyone, camera men, women that operate at the moment? What are you doing? Yeah, part of the <laughs> he's being shy. Yeah, he's being shy. I know. <laughs> but, but okay, good. Qu it's a question I want to ask because you know we're in the frontline club. John talked a, a lot about you know the <coughs> sacrifices that many journalists have made um, over the years, and we don't use sound men these days. We very rarely use sound engineers at all. It's one person crews. Has this? I'm throwing the question out. Um, if anyone on the panel wants to wants to answer, it's fine. Has this compromised the safety of journalists around the world because there isn't that person to watch their back? There isn't that person to look after the camera operators while they're filming? Is that one of the reasons that we have lost so many of our colleagues um, over the last few years because budgets are cut and there is no longer any um, money to send that sound engineer? Um, and have productions suffered in the process? Um, is the quality of the product worse than it was before? So I'll just kind of throw that out here. But if there's any questions, please feel free. Or not. <laughs> please don't keep making me talk. Well, the, the, the one thing I'll <laughs> throw out, and it might generate some discussion from you guys, but a lot of times there's a story to be told that pe where people may not be willing to tell it on camera, but they might be willing to tell it on, you know, with just voice. And so you oftentimes get into places where you can be invited into someone's house with an <laughs> audio recorder, and that's it, and get a really terrific story. Um, certainly in the field, it, I can't imagine it not compromising the safety of journalists. Tim. Wait, wait for the mic, Tim. Because it's being recording. The entire world wants to hear your dulcet tones. No, I was just going to say that uh, unpredictably I'm responding to something you've asked about six weeks late. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, but to, in answer to your question, I think it's very difficult to know if it is 
uh, more dangerous to be without a sound man and just to be a kind of one man band thing because the whole nature of conflict has changed so much. Um, so the, I don't think you can separate the two, or certainly I can't. So, so you think that that because of the nature of conflict now, and the way wars are, are well, run. Well, the or way operated. the way journalists have uh, been changed in it, or are perceived differently in it, is is a very different thing. You know, the, back in the day, we could go to lots of places, and we were kind of, you know, not uh, not holy people in any which way. Trust me. Mm. But you know, th we were untouchable in many ways, and, y and if you got in trouble, then it was unlucky. Now, it's lucky if you don't get in trouble. I would say to some of these things. But I actually just wanted to ask a question. In the movie, you you mentioned the Interim Hamway called you to the church, um, and I just I I hadn't heard that before, and I find that really interesting. Would, did they specifically want to show you this? Did it happen frequently? H you know, how did that work? <coughs> well, uh, the first time, the first day when we arrived in Kigali, because we went through Burundi, we found them on the road. So they took us to Mill Collin oh. Hotel. So every morning they will just come dance around that area. And then they will tell us, today we are going to kill people on, at this site. So for that day, they came and said, people, uh, we are going to kill people in the church. So if you want to come and cover, just come. Because they were protecting us. We were moving with them because they were the strongest side. So we went there 10, 15 minutes after they started uh, these uh, killings. And can I just ask, was it, did they single you, your crew out specifically, or was it just an open invitation? Well, because we, we are the first journalists there, so they, they knew that this is the only journalists around here, and they invite us to go and see what they are doing. And there's another side to that, which Abdul, you mentioned to me before, was they thought you were a Tutsi first. When, when he first arrived in, in Rwanda with, with Shafi, into Kigali, they, they thought you were Tutsis. Yeah, <coughs> when uh, we arrived first, because I was in the middle of uh, three white people, then they <laughs> asked me, are you a Tutsi or a Hutu? I said, I'm a Nubian, I'm not a Tutsi. <laughs> and they didn't believe you? So until I gave them my passports, press cards, and the Kenya National ID, that's the time they were comfortable with me. <coughs> That's uh, fine. Abdul, for this, uh, thank you. On oh, the same uh, question that that Tim asked, if they invite you to go to that, this is where they're going to do their his job, so to speak. What would happen if you said no? We don't want to go. Uh, number one, and number two, by going, will you encourage them? Were they being encouraged to, to carry out the shooting because of the presence of the cameras? Uh, OK, I know it's not uh, right to go with them, because that is like uh, advertise what they are doing. But uh, on our part, it's for our safety. I think if, if I may add to that, Faridun, there is two sides to this. One is, it was no secret that thousands of people at that point, by day two, which is when these guys came in from the south and I came in from the north, um, everyone knew, the whole world knew that thousands of people were being killed, right? And if the only way you're able to show the world that people are being killed is by actually going with the bad guys, maybe it's for the better. Because whether or not you go, they are still going to be killed, right? Um, the same way, I mean, I'll, go, I'll now push forward to, or I'll rather go back to 1993, uh, July, when the four guys were killed, uh, our colleagues were killed in, in Mogadishu, right? The Americans had spent about four hours shelling this building where there were Somali elders, right? And one of the guys came out, who we trusted, right? Came to the, the Sahafi Hotel at K4 in Mogadishu and called our journalists and said, come and see what the Americans have done. Now, any journalist would follow these guys, right? And the people who followed ended up dying, 
right? So even in this case, these guys could have gone out, and maybe it was a trap, and they die. But at least they ended up showing what was going on. Yeah, some of the first pictures you see, there's a long shot. You see people being chopped in the distance, right? And then all the bodies all over the place. And that told the story. Unfortunately, in the Somalia case, it went the other way. You got there, and the mob turned against you. <coughs> there was more people than the guards who had called them to go and see what the Americans had done, and they just turned against, uh, against the journalists. So there's a two sides to that. And I, I, I would have done the same thing these guys did. I would have gone, and I would have done the same thing this, the guys in Mogadishu did. It's a little bit linked to what you were saying, uh, and also something that you said in the documentary about Somalia, that you said something that you were there for the people reporting what, like the things that they were happening to people, and those same people you were for, they were the ones beating up to death <coughs> journalists. So I work on protection of humanitarian <coughs> workers, <laughs> so, and I, I was in Libya after the revolution, and I left because I was, I'm going to get killed. Um, so my question is, what drives you to stay there when, when you see that kind of nonsense that of situation that you are there for the people, and is that, that very same people the ones that may harm you? Can I have another quick one? Sure. Uh, it's something you said at the beginning about how good um, a sound man is as an eyewitness. So I was wondering if, uh, Abdul, you've been called to testify because you've been in a lot of countries where, like ICTR, so you have the, tri the Rwanda Tribunal, um, and some of the footage you took that would make very good footage uh, to be shown in trial, this as linkage evidence or something. Um, you've been also in Sudan. There is an investigation going on in the International Criminal Court. So have you ever been called to testify? And if you are being called to bring testimony to a court, would you be willing to, or do you think your duty as a journalist doesn't go that far, it's only reporting it? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> well, <coughs> I'm a journalist, and uh, if they call me, I will not go. Because I'll just send them a picture, the footage, for them to judge by themselves. But I can't go. Pardon? It, it will be useless because the judge, the prosecutor, wouldn't be able to authenticate that piece of evidence. Well, because that is not my job. I'm not okay. a peacekeeper. I'm a journalist. So if they want to a witness, they can get uh, peacekeepers, UN peacekeepers, to do that. I believe this, this is more of a legal issue than more, more, more in, in, in our direction. Yeah. What we believe in, and this, this has happened before in the past, it happened to us in South Africa, it almost happened to us in Kenya at some point, whereby the government will want to try and compel you to provide uh, material relating to a certain e uh, event. Now, what we've been told legally is they can use whatever we broadcast, right, because we put it out into the public, because we believe it was genuine. Unless anybody can prove otherwise, they can use that. But they cannot come and compel the person on the ground to go and give evidence or to go to court, go and be, be, be a witness, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, journalists have a special status. Uh, like, you wouldn't be called to testify generally uh, to the ICC unless you want to, just because you could compromise your source. But, um, I mean, it's the same problem we have with humanitarian workers that they're generally at the front line. They make very good eyewitnesses, but then they are not willing to, to testify because somehow it will also undermine a little bit their mission, which is different to bring justice. Their mission as a humanitarian worker is providing relief, and your mission as a reporter is to report. <coughs> but I was wondering if any of you would be willing to, it's a little bit if you put in the balance, well, your, um, your duty as a journalist or as a reporter and your duty as a human being who has witnessed um, egregious crimes. So it was a little bit to throw in out there if, if you think that you are a journalist over everything and your mission is different. I, you know, I, I, just to add to I'm that. I'm not criticizing the decision no, at no, all. No. Sorry, but just saying. To add a little bit to that discussion too, the, and you sort of alluded to it, 
um, as well. The, the nature of conflict has changed significantly, but so has the nature of journalism. So we're seeing a lot more citizen journalism than we've ever seen um, and more advocacy journalism than we've ever seen. And in those cases, it's that their perception of their own job is to highlight and then be a witness to whatever atrocity it might be. You saw it in Tahir Square. You've seen it you know, in, in a number of conflicts. Um, but that's a little bit different than the way I think we were brought into this particular profession and the ethics. Um, around that have have also been different, um, and in many cases we I didn't particularly do it eloquently, but I talked about the fact that journalists very rarely have any kind of protection when they're in the field. Um, that's been one of the real eye openers for the citizen journalists who are out there now with iPhones or any other kind of device, but they have a different goal. Yeah, I, I, I want to yeah yeah I, um, as, as soon as you're done. Sure. I just want to get Jim there because he's got a legal opinion there. Perfect. I just want to ask quickly. <laughs> so you have children. What do you tell them about human beings, given what you've seen, just drawing on what you're saying about humans? What do you tell them to trust people? Or how do you reconcile in your mind what you've seen? And then what do you teach your children about whether to trust people or not trust people or what makes someone bad or not bad? What conclusions Patrick? have you drawn? <laughs> Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about myself personally, um, because like was mentioned, my daughter was born in 1994, in October, and i just come through the Rwandan genocide, and I'd seen pe children killed, I'd seen um, children displaced, I'd seen children, <laughs> former ministers, former high-powered people living in refugee camps in then Zaire just across the border and queuing in the morning for porridge and maize and beans and whatever. And like I said, this is not what I would ever want any human being or even any child growing up. In my opinion, two guys in a uniform, in a uniform carrying guns, they can blow each other to bits. I don't care because that's what they signed up for, right? But when you start targeting civilians, children, old, young, women, then suddenly it's, it's a completely different ball game. So when I come home now, right, and I find even in my neighborhood, um, you try and talk to people. I talk to my daughter. We talk a lot. Um, right now we've got even more, even more dangers now. We've got, I mean, the social, social media is completely, I mean, somebody wants to befriend you on Facebook, you have no idea who they are. They might put a pretty picture of a handsome young man or whatever they are. It could be some old geriatric who's got other nasty ideas in his head, <coughs> right? That's even more dangerous. So we talk about these things. We talk about, you know, you go out socially, what are you going to have? Are you going to have a drink? Is it going to be spiked by somebody? Are you going to be smoking weed, snorting something or the other, injecting? All these things are there. And I think, in my opinion, if we want to be straight with each other and, and, and very direct, these are things we have to confront because society changes, we have to change with it. In the old days, my father would put me over his knee and beat the hell out of me. And that would be it. Tomorrow, I'd not repeat whatever I'd messed up about. But now, I think we just need to talk because even if I do that and you go into your room and you pick up your tab or your phone, you can do whatever you want. I, I, unless I want to monitor it 24 7, the, most is the, the, the best I believe is to have trust in each other. And, and that's, that's, that's my side of how to deal with, 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 with children and families. Abdul, how do you interact with your kids? Well, for me, I used to tell them to respect people. Because I've seen in Rwanda a small Hutu, his or her mom will just tell him, you see this Hutu or Tutsi, they are bad. They have killed our people since 1950s. So don't respect them. <coughs> in uh, 1994, I saw a small boys and girls in a police cell that a Hutu killed Tutsi, and he's 12 years old. So it's the parents who are bad because if you say this tribe is this, this tribe is this, then they, whenever they are growing up, they, their mentality will be this, this, this. 
I'm not going to ask you, Chip, because you just talk about me. Bad things that I do. I'm such a good influence. Yeah, I know. Yeah, great influence. Uh, before I answer or address the, the legal question and your question, ma'am, I, I wanted to, we had seen several ideations of uh, the documentary before it was shown in Nairobi. And so I had the privilege of sitting in the row with um, Patrick's children, and right in front of us were Abdul's children and his wife. And I didn't look at the film. I watched them the whole time because, you know, you, uh, you wonder what do your parents do when they go to work each day? And I saw for the first time in all of their children's eyes, they were clueless about what their parents did, what incredible human beings they are, the, the lives that they saved, probably hundreds of thousands of lives by exposing genocide and, and the excesses of humankind. And it was just amazing to watch these children because every single one of them, you guys didn't see it, but every single one of them was trying to choke back tears. It was just incredible. It was an incredible experience for me. It was the, the best gift of the, the presentation. Now getting to the legal issue, um, I can answer it this way. You, you wouldn't be compelled, regardless of how you acquire the information, to disgorge it in the United States. However, I would point out this to you. It's never the legal issue, it's the practical issue. If you guys had gone to uh, Mogadishu, and then you'd come out and advocated about the horrors that went on there as one group did this. When you went to Rwanda, you probably wouldn't come back. You can't, they can't take a position. They really can't because at that point in time, that's their last mission for them certainly and most probably for anybody else who assumes that role to, to expose these excesses and the insanity that seems to go on. So that's my two cents, whatever. I've got two questions too. One was the woman behind me asked it, and I think it didn't get answered. Which was in the film you said, um, you know, it's the people that you're trying to show that are killing you. Um, what's the point? And I just wondered if you had thoughts about that, whether it's just a rhetorical question or whether you do feel sometimes what's the point. And the other question was about living in Kibera in the slum. And quite early in the film, you said that um, your children weren't going to stay there. And I just wondered whether you meant you were moving now, or you mean when they're grown up, they won't stay there? Because you're living there now, right? And the children are living there now. Yep. Uh, Kibera was not a slum when I was born. Kibera became a slum after independence, because Kibera was given to our great-grandfather by British, so British uh, government as their pension after First and Second World War. There were, I think, three or 500 uh, families. So after independence, the politicians brought a lot of uh, people to help them for uh, election. So now it's a place where people like me Okay, I can stay there because I've got uh, maybe two, three years in the in the world because I'm too old and too tired. <laughs> <laughs> so for my children, I'll have to move them out of Kibera. So you're planning to move in two or three years? Yeah. Yeah. I just didn't quite understand. Before He's I pass away. He's planning to die in two or three years. <laughs> Before I die. I, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the issues there are around the ownership of the, the land in Kibera is very, it's in the center of Nairobi and it's very valuable land, but his ancestors were given that land and now it's literally gone from 4,500 acres to about 450 acres and it's, the mo I think it's the most densely populated place in Africa at this point. I understood that from yeah. the film, it was well explained. I just literally wondered, I didn't understand the thing about that you, want, you didn't want to bring the children up there because obviously you are bringing the children up there at the moment. Still want me to answer the other it's question? About, yeah. Is it worth it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. It <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I, I, no story is ever worth dying for. That's for sure. It's something. I mean, my father was gung ho, crazy man, journalist um, uh, that went everywhere and did everything. Uh, but I think even he would completely agree that there is absolutely no story that is worth dying for. And. It makes you question. I mean, Somalia, I never went back to Somalia after 1993. I never, ever went back. I still haven't been back since 1993 simply because I didn't care anymore. I don't care if the Somalis kill themselves. 
Um, really, I mean, it was, it was, it, it left, these are much stronger men than I am. Um, it really left that bad a, a taste in, 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 in my mouth. It, it, it affected me so much that, you know, these were people that were trying to tell the story from the Somali perspective, trying to, I mean, someone like Dan, Dan was a close friend of mine. I went to school with Dan. I grew up with him. Um, one of the most talented uh, photojournalists, I think, ever, and was only 22 years old. And yet, when he was called the mayor of Mogadishu, jokingly, because he used to go into Bukhara Market, which was the most dangerous place in Mogadishu, he would go in there in his, um, in his uh, Kikoi cloth, and he would sit with the elders, and he would, you know, chew cut with them and chat with them. And, and he was known by everybody, and yet, these were women and children that beat him to death, uh, along with Anthony and, and Hansi and Hoss. Um, the American uh, gunship pilot that hovered over that incident and asked his base, you know, uh, white Caucasian male, you know, being seen, being pursued there, are all of our troops safe? And when he gets the word back, he has no, no American troops, and I don't do anything. Watch these guys beat Dan to death. All he had to do was fire a, a few rounds above the crowd or, or land the helicopter, and they would have taken off, and Dan might have still been alive. But, you know, these are things that make you wonder, you know, what is the point? I mean, w yes, we should tell a lot of these stories, but sometimes, for me personally, uh, Somalia is not a story that I would want to deal with at all, ever. That's me personally, so please don't take that as the general profession. <laughs> um, there, there are a lot of journeys that go back, but yeah. No, don't want to dig your hole any deeper than I already have. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Hi, um, I really enjoy the movie, by the way. Um, I'm a fellow sound man, and I'm wondering, with all the things you've seen and uh, all the stories, all the, all the horrors, um, what keeps you going? Why? Yeah, I take it you're still you're, you're still working in the industry. What what keeps it fresh as such? Can you repeat that question again, please? So um, I'm just saying, why 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 are you still doing it with all the things you've seen? It, not the paycheck, I'll tell you. That. <coughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I keep on doing because it is in my blood, and uh, I I can't do any other job apart from sound or camera or journalism 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 especially because now i can't drive a tractor <laughs> can't, so i'll just continue with the job that i have had for 37 years abdul how did it feel to lose so many people from a small company like ours we've lost a lot of people over the years friends of yours what do you feel about being around <coughs> Can, can I just question? add something to what you just asked of him? I, I've been just documenting and observing most of this story, but one of the things I've noticed at Camera Picks and at A24, which is the sister company, is that today Abdul is still doing sound but also has become a teacher. And there are, I don't know, Salim, how many employees at 60. A24? 60. 60. All of them go to him for advice, technical advice, aesthetic advice, career advice. Um, and so uh, it, I've noticed that just in the last three or four years that, uh, that your role as a mentor, as a teacher has changed really significantly just since I've known you. And so that's inspiring to see. Okay, I'll go Take back, sorry, I'll go back to Salim's uh, question. Well, it's sad to lose, I think, seven or eight people in a small company. It's very sad because I'm the only person, and Patrick, who survived. And uh, I don't like to talk about it because I wish they were here. They will talk for themselves. But we lost a lot of people. And it's, and it's, it's not just... 
a huge, like we're saying, it's what, 60 people? Mm. It's not a huge organization where you've heard of somebody and <laughs> there's just another name that you see on a group email or, or something. These are people you would interact with every day. You knew their families, they knew your families. So when it gets to that point and you realize this person isn't there anymore, and it's not because he died naturally, it's because he was out on assignment, you would have been with him, you could have been with him. Um, uh, that just makes it more painful. Um, and, and, and I mean, this part where, this, there's a part of this film which I don't really like looking at. Uh, you try and think back on the happy memories of the things we did and all that, but unfortunately you will still end up getting to the point where you realize they are no longer here because of ABCD. But what I say on the other end is they didn't fall down the stairs and die, break a neck and die. Maybe they probably died doing what they like doing best. That's, that's how I try and console myself. And they were very young. They were very young. And they were very young, which is another painful part. But again, it happened. You just try and uh, console yourself and uh, live with the happy memories. Do, we'll do a couple more questions. Those three. Um, yeah, Okay. <laughs> Charlie? Hi. Um, I uh, am a son of a journalist and a uh, war journalist for like several years. And he, my dad, would never talk about anything uh, when he came back at all, did he? No. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and it took, I mean, I think we, my sister and I had this sort of coming of age type thing when we asked to see some of his Rwanda videos and he wheeled in this whole VHS you know, player and TV into his office and we watched some pretty horrific stuff. I was 16 or something, uh, so 10 years ago. And, um, I mean, he's always been so private about it and, and never interested in talking about it at dinner parties or anything. It's just, you know, he comes back, he used to say he just would go and do a weekly shop at Sainsbury's or something and just, you know, he's just been to genocide in Rwanda. It's like, it's not your average day. Um, how do you feel about your job and uh, kind of sort of, ex not expo I mean exposing a nice word, um, exposing your experiences in this film. How did you go into, what mindset did you have going into making this film? Uh, for my dad it would be sort of his worst nightmare to do this and for us all to be sitting here and watching it because he's, he, you know, he doesn't want to deal with it. So how did you go into that in terms of your first meetings and making the film? Maybe Chip, you want to address that? Well, I, I, I mentioned it at the start a little bit, but the film really began with Abdul sharing stories over coffee on a very peaceful and quite positive assignment in Ethiopia. We were working for one.org, uh, telling the story of how Northwest Ethiopia had changed in a positive way since the famine of 85. So it was really a very lovely shoot for a couple of weeks. And the stories emerged out of that. And at the time, I didn't know Patrick. We started uh, with just Abdul agreeing to participate in the film and Salim, obviously. Uh, and, and then when we started looking for other interview subjects, that's when I really, the reality check for me was there aren't that many other people from that period to talk with. So you're looking at the guys right here. Um, but in terms of how it's impacted you guys, it's really up to you uh, to answer that. Did you find it cathartic? I, I mean, like, like, I don't know how to answer that now. Um, some of the stories we did, basically, were out to inform the world what was going on, right? And I don't know whether we have a system where we compartment compartmentalize things <laughs> whereby you decide this is for when we're out in the field this is for when I get home right because again the next time we didn't have satellite phones then, right we had uh, uh, sorry we didn't have no mobile, mobile phones, phones then. we had so satellite phones that were this big 40 kilos <laughs> and we thought we were very lucky that you could be able to make a phone call home every evening to say I'm safe <laughs> But of course, when you start walking through the jungle, there's no power. Right? You can't carry that thing in the middle of fighting. 
And when you come home, I mean, all you want is peace. I mean, and that, that's what Abdul's wife says here. Uh, when he comes home, he doesn't want to talk much. He just wants to relax. Because the moment you open up and you tell all these horrors, what they see on TV, I mean, you've seen more than people see on TV. Most of this stuff is edited out. When you see your, your evening broadcast or whatever, most of this stuff is edited out because it won't run because, I don't know, families, children are watching. Um, so it's the same thing. When you come home, you, you sort of like shut off a bit of that. Um, when we meet up with Abdul, uh, we'll remember the day we met so and so and we got sort of a roadblock and we managed to uh, lie and cheat and sneak through the roadblock and get through and we laugh about it. Or at the end of a bad day, we sit at the bar, the, the hotel or under a tree, wherever we're staying, and we share a bottle of whiskey and we laugh about the, what the day has been. And somehow you try and, try and put that aside in a different compartment that maybe you shall open later, you hope you shall never open. But you don't want to take some of those things home because if you do, Next time the phone call comes and you say, I don't know when I'll be back home. Not like today when I can answer on a thuraya and say, you know what, I'm in the middle of here and I've been, I'm fine. We used to leave in the morning at 5 or 4 a.m. And you say, I don't know when I'll, I'll be back home. Six weeks later, two months later, you rock up. That year's God knows what because you haven't had a chance to change your clothes. And uh, you just say, I'm fine. And they're happy to see you. My daughter, when she was growing up, she'd look at this stranger and take off. She's not seen you. I mean, she's just in her early, early months, years, and she hasn't seen you. And she just take off, wondering who the hell is this. And um, I just, again, just try and calm down and just tell everybody it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And yes, some of our people who we worked with then, and even now, I mean, people who are exposed to such things, um, there's the other negative effect where basically. Uh, some of us managed to almost. Salim here is totally convinced that Abdul and I are completely mad, right? But, <laughs> but they are the other guys who Abdul and I are convinced when we see them, we, uh, we know they are mad <laughs> because of their behaviors. Yeah? Some of them go down into this, others go down into violence, others just go downhill. They find all sorts of substances to, to sort out their, their, their issues, nightmares, whatever, all that sort of stuff. It's there. I mean, we're not superhuman beings, no. Yeah, these things will come to you in memories and you think, you'll go to a certain place and you'll remember this is where. I mean, I go to Rwanda and I think this is where, as beautiful as it is now and peaceful and supposed to be very modern, this is where there were bodies we found. This is where, in the midst of about 500 bodies, which were being put on a truck for disposal, this young, small girl woke up and realized she was still alive after three days, lying in the midst. So all these memories will come back, but we try and not take them home. It's like taking your work home from, even from an office. It's not right, is it? Because home is home. Are you good? Yeah. His wife says no. Let's go. no. His wife sound, says no. His wife man, says he's gonna stay. And sound do man never talks mm. too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you you can, can leave him to them. <laughs> so that might defeat the question I'm about to ask, which is in relation to um, you've talked a lot about your roles as um, you know as sound men, and when you're there at the actual scene in terms of what's going on, and you are fantastic contemporaneous eyewitnesses. Um, this isn't a legal question at all, but I am curious to know, when you see stories unfolding, like with the Nairobi election and the riots that happened, do you at that point feel compelled to almost take your work home with you or to do something about it because you know the consequences of what will happen with those sorts of actions or the sorts of routes that people follow? Well, you kind of answered, I think, I mean, good question. Patrick kind of answered that a little bit in the film where he said, you know, in, 19, in, in 2007, when we saw what was happening in, in Kenya, uh, there were flashbacks of Rwanda. And, and, and you know, you, you tried to tell people that this is, you, you really don't want to go down this route because of the consequences of what we've seen. But how much we can do, I mean, we can tell that story. We can keep you know, hammering on about it. But often it's not the ordinary people that are that, that want to do these things. It is the
the people in power, it's the politicians, it's a, it's a small group of people that are orchestrating a lot of these events for their own, um, for their own benefit. Um, you know, the Kenyan elections was not, yes, there were tribal issues, there, there, was, there were root causes of some of the hatred, but this was fueled by the politicians. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes no matter what the media says or does, these guys want to, they, they want to complete that process because they have something to gain out of it. And that's, that's, we can only tell those stories as much as possible. Often we're telling, and this is one of our failures, I think, as the media, again, I'm being very general, is we don't often point out the problems before they actually start. We kind of react to the stories as opposed to doing something about it before it happens. We're reacting to it, so we're always playing catch up almost and we're just reporting what's happening rather than giving context beforehand trying to prevent it um, and, and in 2007 in Kenya the media was hugely complicit in what happened in that election because the media had taken sides and, and really had um, caused a lot of the, 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 the tension that, that then boiled over into what, what we saw. You know, one thing I would add to that, because I, I was with these guys in Kenya in the post-election uh, and working alongside them, and one of the things that I've found over the years is I get, I get to go home. I, 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 it doesn't matter when we were in Afghanistan or Darfur or wherever. I know <laughs> that at some point I'm going to leave, and then it's not my story anymore, but I noticed with you guys in Kenya a very different energy that the three of them had because they, they were at home. There was nowhere else to go. This was very, very serious. And I, it, you know, when Eldoret happened, the church, it really did look like Rwanda. And there was nowhere for you to go. So your daughter who's here, it's like, well, no, there was, you weren't gonna fly to another country. It was like, however that played out, it, it, it wound up um, becoming more peaceful over time. But however it played out, there was nowhere for you to go. It's a different story. As a journalist. I'm not sure we've answered the question, but I hope that's okay. I just because we, I know we have to sh close down, Juliana. Tim, you want to do the? I mean, first, firstly, please. Um, in 2007, 2008, and, and before that, there's no international news editor in the world that would have paid for a feed of a story about something that might happen. Um, so I don't think local news perhaps, or domestic news, but, but in terms of international, I don't think there was any complicity or, or can be in that sense, because you don't make the calls as to what gets fed, what gets broadcast, whatever. Um, no, the point I wanted to make was, certainly from my experiences, there was a, a point earlier about, you know, how do you speak to your kids? How do you deal with life at home when you've seen the most horrible, horrible things? It may be different in Rwanda, Somalia, wherever, but certainly, Again, from my experience, for every five or so really unpleasant things, you, are, you do see some of the most incredible pieces of humanity and people going out of their way, local people going out of their way to make sure that you're safe, to give you their last bit of food, to make sure that they'll fix your car when it's in a, you know, a, a rut or whatever, w when you're being chased. I d wondered if that was also your experience, because that's what I have focused on and other people have focused on when speaking to kids, because it's not all gloom way to end it. Great stories, guys. Things that made you smile. In in the 90s, just after the um, the Americans and the UN coalition was formed, uh, we we had a house which we used to call the Reuters Villa in Mogadishu. It was a multiple-storied house. We had about 12 guards, we had cars, all of them armed, everything. Um, and in the evenings, Anthony, uh, the late, and I sometimes would take a walk down the road without guards or anything. After dinner, we'd take a walk. There were street lights, right? And the street lights were organized by a guy called Elman. It was Somali, crazy looking, completely crazy looking. The American Taking Marines the loved him. He was called Elman, the electrician. And he had dreadlocks for a Somali. I mean, that's quite an achievement. <laughs> and on the main street, um, he had this huge, he, was, he repaired generators, 
the Americans and the UN supplied him with fuel because he was actually putting up street lights. And in the evening, we would actually go and sit with him until about, sit with him and just chat and talk and talk and talk. Of course, he's happy on his, chewing his, uh, this narcotic leaf, the, the mirror, the cat. Mm. Uh, so he's on a different high. We are on the other side on a different high. Mm. Um, and you'd realize if you had more and more of these people, such people, I mean, this would end up really well. I mean, he had put up so street lights almost, I'd say maybe a quarter of the main residential areas of Mogadishu. Because the UN would put up lights outside their bases, the Americans, whoever the other soldiers were. Um, WFP would put up outside because they had huge generators, um, uh, ICRC and the rest. And he, he was just doing his own bit. Huh? Um, and unfortunately, when um, Al-Shabaab came in, they killed him. So there was that nice part to seeing somebody trying to, to make good something. Uh, but unfortunately, um, clearly somebody didn't appreciate that. But at that time, I mean, we used to love the guy. We used to go and stop over, call him Elman, we just sit with him, and we just walk back at midnight because the whole area is just lit. Yeah, now, even now, I don't think you can do that anymore. But yeah, that's, that's one of my happy things that I remember about Somalia. Abdul, any happy people that you met? Huh? No. <laughs> 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 Completely, they are all mad. I like to talk about them. <laughs> I heard them. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, so thank you. I just want to say a very big thank you here to Jim and Sue Town. You know, they made it possible for us to be here, uh, to, for all of us to get here and, and to do this screening. So, so please give them a round of applause.